it's actually our second collaboration um, this year um, between the Worcester JCC and the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Some of you may have been here back in March for our, our inaugural event, which was James Carroll speaking on his latest book, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Uh, it's thrilling to be back here just nine months later and to be co-sponsoring a second event, Paula Fredrickson, one of the world's foremost scholars on Augustine, discussing her latest book, Augustine and the Jews, A Christian Defense of Jews and Judaism. Thank you to Tom Landy, director of the McFarland Center, for his enthusiastic support in continuing on this path of partnership. This lecture, as he said, is supported by the Kraft Hyatt Fund for Jewish Christian Understanding at Holy Cross and by the Jewish Federation of Central Mass and Jewish Book Council. Copies of Paula's book will be available for sale following the talk, and she'll be signing them. And also, please enjoy your refreshments out in the hallway at, the, at that time as well. Thank you. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Nancy. On behalf of Holy Cross, I would say we're delighted at this collaboration with the Worcester JCC. And it is my particular honor to introduce to you Paula Fredrickson this evening. Uh, she is now the William Goodwin Aurelio Chair, speaking of long titles, Emerita at Boston University, uh, of the Appreciation of Scripture at Boston University, having held that chair in an active capacity for 20 years. She attended Wellesley College, Oxford University, and then Princeton University, and has spent her career producing important translations and award-winning books, including From Jesus to Christ, The Origins of the New Testament Images of Jesus, for which she won the 1988 Yale Press Governor's Award for Best Book, and Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, A Jewish Life and the Emergence of Christianity, for which she won a National Jewish Book Award. She has also been an important contributor to research and discussion on Jewish-Christian relations and voiced a valuable critique of Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. This work continues in her latest book and topic for this evening, Augustine and the Jews, A Christian Defense of Jews and Judaism. And I would also like to add a note from my personal experience with Professor Friedrichsen that she's a generous mentor and a gracious colleague and someone that I look up to. And frankly, she's, she's basically what I want to be when I grow up. So it's my particular pleasure to uh, welcome you, uh, Paula, to Holy Cross. Please join me in welcoming Paula. Thank you for, thank you for coming out this evening. It's uh, tis a fit night for neither man nor beast. Um, and uh, I'll give you two kinds of dessert. The second will be the kosher Sicilian wedding cookies, which are, are outside on the table after the lecture. But the first is this amazing dimension of Augustine, which I discovered completely by accident. And um, it's something that uh, I was very excited when I discovered it. I'll talk about that momentarily. And I was very happy when, after 15 years, I finally finished the book. And um, thanks to the miracle of email, I finally got feedback from uh, all sorts of different readers. And two groups in particular loathed the book and took issue with my main point. They were liberal Jews and conservative Roman Catholics, both of which groups informed me sternly that Augustine did not like Jews. And the book, uh, the book was wrong. And um, I'm going to try to give you a more nuanced picture of what the project is. What, I'm, what I'll be presenting to you tonight is the way Augustine reflected theologically about Jews and Judaism. And uniquely, of all of the church fathers whose works weigh heavily on the shelves of libraries at Holy Cross and elsewhere, he alone of all of these an incredibly talented and complex thinkers that create classical Christian theology, he came up with a, with a positive defense of Jews and of Judaism as a theological principle necessary for Christianity. 
In other words, he argued that without Judaism and without its own Jewishness, Christianity couldn't be Christianity. But he's writing as a fourth century bishop. He's not Christer Stendhal, for those of you who know Christer Stendhal. He's not a Massachusetts liberal Democrat. I am. He was a fourth century North African bishop. And he's living in a culture that is very different from our contemporary culture. And if you look at the first um, three items on our handout, I gave these to you so you won't have to bother with um, notes, but you'll have something to uh, think about um, after uh, the lecture. It's a culture where educated, mostly men, educated men are educated in rhetoric. And the, the science of rhetoric in ancient education is learning how to make a convincing oral argument. The point of rhetoric is persuasion. The point of rhetoric is particularly how to argue about the meaning of a text, whether a text is a contract or a treaty or a will. Um, I name those sorts of documents because there's something forensic, something lawyerly. It's intrinsically argumentative. And the goal of rhetoric is persuasion, which means the image of the object, the counter-argument of the rhetoric, is not to give an accurate description. What we get when we read ancient rhetoric is a caricature of whatever the opposition thinks of, of saying. So rhetoric is the way that argument is structured in antiquity. And Augustine himself is a professional wordsmith. He was trained as a, in rhetoric. He was a professor of rhetoric um, for a while. And so the style of argument is how he and everybody he engages with argues. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because when we read these ancient people's works, we're reading intellectual exercises. People don't write about their feelings. This is not about Augustine's feelings. It's about his arguments that he's having with other Gentile Christians um, in the fourth century. Something else to bear in mind when we imaginatively transport ourselves back to Augustine's lifetime is cosmology. We're in an Earth-centered universe. The Earth is at the center of the universe. The five planets known to antiquity and the sun and the moon move around the Earth. And then the realm of the fixed stars is beyond that. This mental image of the architecture of reality, at the same time, besides giving a glimpse at how the cosmos is organized, gives you a sense of what matters morally. What is up is better, morally as well as metaphysically, from what is down. What is down is is lower and also, in a sense, morally defective compared to what is up. Something else to remember about ancient cosmology, and again, this is the map of reality that everybody I'll be speaking about tonight functions with, is that all of these planetary and astral entities are intelligences. Stars are not inanimate objects. They are ensouled beings with intelligence. So are stars and planets. And Philo, a, uh, a first century contemporary of Jesus and of Paul, can quite casually refer to these stars and planets as gods. Philo is a Jew. He writes a commentary on Genesis. And when he's describing God's work in framing the universe, he will name the stars and planets and refer to them as theoi. Gods, which brings me to the third point to bear in mind while I try to give you the imagined um, context for this, uh, this discussion of Jews and Judaism. In antiquity, all monotheists were polytheists by our standards, by which I mean to say that ancient monotheism, unlike modern monotheism, Ancient monotheism is not about the existence of only one god. Ancient monotheism is about the organization of the divine universe. And as long as you have a single high god on top, you can have however many other lesser 
lower divinities that you need to fill in the gap between the highest God and everything else that is. And usually lower gods organize matter on behalf of the high God, and these lower gods can be referred to as the logos, or it, a lower god can be referred to as the demiurge. In um, early forms of Christianity, this will be the role ascribed to Christ in his pre-incarnate phase, so that the organization of this cosmos is the work of lower gods because the highest god, according to the canons of philosophy and physics, because we're dealing again with the cosmos, because the truly perfect god is radically changeless, it doesn't move because motion implies imperfection. So we're dealing with the universe where there are many, many deities, and the lower deities are local. The lower deities tend to attach to particular people. These lower gods are attracted by the smell of sacrifices. And the word in Greek for lower gods is a word that will come into English. I'll say it in Greek, and then you'll recognize the English word. Quoting Psalm 95.5 in Greek, the gods of the nations are daimones. The singular is daimon. It comes into English as demon. The word for lower god in antiquity is, is a demon. And that doesn't necessarily have a negative meaning the way it does in vernacular English. But lower, the job of a lower god is to help with the running of all this movement, moving and therefore imperfect busyness that uh, describes life, especially life in the realm below the moon, which is where we live. If you look at our chronology very quickly, the reason why this culture is as widespread as it is is because of Alexander the Great, who takes Greek culture and puts it out on the road, with the result that by minus 200, Jews in the Western diaspora had changed their vernaculars from Hebrew and Aramaic to Greek, and as a result, the scriptures and traditions of Israel have been translated into Greek as well. That Greek translation of the Jewish Bible is known as the Septuagint. And what this means is that these ancient Jewish traditions are available to non-Jews from minus 200 on. And that will really be one of the cultural, the necessary cultural um, events that will enable the existence of Christianity um, several centuries um, down the road from, um, from there. If you look at the two double columns that you see, these put together rhetoric, cosmology, and in a sense that theology of, of ancient monotheism. Ancient rhetors taught that opposites give beauty to a verbal presentation. If you can use opposites in a sentence, it has more punch. So fair and foul a day I have not seen. No, it's, it's, it's aesthetically pleasing. And what you get, because these people are trained to think in terms of pairs, are things that are linked. So if you look at the Greco-Roman binary opposites or binary pairs, you see spirit contrasted with matter or spirit contrasted with flesh. And there's a positive, there's a positive um, meaning to spirit, whereas in contrast to spirit, flesh and matter is negative by comparison. This isn't a hard thought to think because all of these, these originally Greek concepts carry over and they're formative of our own culture. Moving down uh, that row, soul or body as opposed to mind, the mind-body problem. Intelligible, meaning things that you can perceive through your reason, through your intellect, is a higher order of thinking and knowing than things that are, quote, sensible, things that you can perceive with your senses. The one, this is a platonic handle, the one is superior to the many because manyness implies imperfection and oneness implies perfection. Allegory, which is a spiritual way of understanding a text, 
is superior, the spiritual meaning of a text is superior morally and intellectually to the narrative level of a text, the, the text that's just the story element. All of these things encode value as well as give these, these contrasting pairs. And finally, eternity is superior to time. Okay, thinking with those contrasting pairs and the kind of pulsing negative positive um, that they um, contain, if you jump back to our chronology, we have a form of messianic Judaism in the wake of the execution of uh, Jesus of Nazareth when some of his disciples perceive him raised and begin to take his mission and the memory of his message out into the diaspora, the Apostle Paul, um, around the year 50, is especially important in spreading traditions about Jesus, but changes the ethnicity of the audience. Paul and other people uh, than Paul will go and give this Jewish message of a Messiah who's come and who's about to come back, and they will give this message to Gentiles. The word for Gentile and the word for pagan is the same word in Greek. So they will give this message um, to a new audience, and the new audience is able to read the scriptures of Israel or hear them and understand them because they're available in Greek. And it's from this, this is sort of the genetic pool out of which um, Christianity will form. In the year 70, Rome destroys the temple in Jerusalem because of a revolt in Judea. And in 132, 135, there's a second revolt in Judea and Rome destroys the entire city of Jerusalem and builds a pagan city on top of it. This was understood by contemporary pagans to mean that the gods of Rome had defeated the God of Israel. That's a normal way to understand the defeat of an ancient person. And it's an, an ancient temple and an ancient people is that their gods had been defeated as well. Those of you who have read the Iliad or the Odyssey, know this idea that gods fight on behalf of the humans they, they're um, interested in. And this is something that later Gentile Christians will have to explain and say, no, 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 our god was not defeated by Rome's gods. Our god wanted the Romans to destroy his temple because he's angry at the Jews, is one of the arguments that you'll get in early Christian theology. So these are the building blocks of, um, of classical Christianity, and it's after this point in the second century that we begin to have evidence for the learned construction of theology on the part of Gentile Christians, so that the ethnicity of the people who are reading and thinking about Christ has changed from being Jews the way it was in Paul's day to, um, to being Gentiles. And this has, this has consequences for understanding those Jewish texts. Let me step back and talk about these Jewish texts for a minute. What will become the Christian Old Testament, but also what is the Christian New Testament. The documents in the Christian New Testament were written for the most part by Greek-speaking Jews. The documents in uh, what will become the Christian Old Testament are the traditions of Israel written in Greek. One of the strongest themes in that Jewish literature is that Jews argue with each other continuously about the right way to be Jewish. And you get that, of course things are different now, no. Um, <laughs> you get that particularly in the Gospels. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're not doing it the right way. You should be doing it my way. And he says that to the Sadducees, and the Sadducees will say that back to him, and then the scribes will jump into it, and everybody's saying, no, you shouldn't do it like this. You should do it like that. Paul, when Paul is complaining about fellow Christian missionaries who are also Jews, who are also going to pagans, he will yell about the way that they're interpreting the Jewish message of Christianity and say that his way of interpreting is right. So that's what we have in both of those um, collections of documents is a very, very vivid internal fight about different types of Judaism or different interpretations of what it is to be a Jew. Once the ethnicity of the readership changes, 
all of those intra-Jewish arguments also change so that they seem to be renunciations of Judaism itself. So that Isaiah, for example, instead of criticizing one way to be Jewish, and he's speaking himself as a Jew, Isaiah will be considered rather a proto-Christian who is saying that Judaism itself, or Christ will be, Jesus Christ will be seen as saying that's not the right way and as renouncing Judaism itself. So what was originally an intra-Jewish fight becomes a kind of condemnation of, um, of Jewishness itself. What happens is an explosion of intra Gentile Christian argument over the right way how to read these texts. After all, that's the way that these intellectuals were trained. So you get these same arguments where this negative image of Jews and Judaism is an accusation that these Gentile Christian authors will use against each other. To call an opponent a Jew, even if you know perfectly well that he's a Gentile Christian, to call him a Jew is a way to line him up on the negative side of, look back at our double columns, of these binary opposites. So if you look at the second column, these are terms that shape and structure the letters of Paul. You'll have gospel as contrasted with law. You'll have grace contrasted with works. Baptism contrasted with circumcision. Spiritual contrasted with fleshly. That word carnal is simply the Latin stem word for flesh, spirit and flesh, spiritual and carnal. And finally, Gentile and Jew. So that you have, again, with this negative positive mapping of these terms, you have all of these terms working together so that Jew ends up on the same part of the negative part of the balance sheet as law, works, circumcision, flesh, um, narrative, time, um, and, and so on. By the way, if we were mapping gender terms onto this column, which side would man be on and which side would woman be on? Right. OK, it's the, it's this, it's the same uh, type of way of structuring an argument. But what you have, if you look, I won't go into the details, but if you think of the second century, the plus second century, as the century where Christian theology as an intellectual discipline is articulated sharply by well-educated, formerly pagan intellectuals, you have this whole discussion of how God, the high God, relates to the world. The issue with the Jewish God, the God who begins creating the universe in Genesis, is that by, according to the canons of um, ancient theology, that God in Genesis is a lower God. The first thing he does is do things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, if you have at least a philosophy 101 education in antiquity, you know that the God being described and introduced there has to be a lower God. And if you continue reading the book, you'd find out, of course, it's a lower God because it's a God who's associated with a particular people, the Jews. He's a God who likes sacrifices and is very concerned with the details of them. That's another thing, a daimon. Um, a lower God tends to be um, involved with, so that the God who's the main character in the Septuagint is a God who is lower than the highest God. There, um, there are some seats up front. So if, it's okay. So if the God of Genesis is the God of the Jews and he's a lower God, 
then who is the father of Jesus Christ? You. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's the higher God, the perfect God. So what you get theologically is the high God of Greco-Roman philosophy being thought of as God the Father. And the God of the Jews is a lower God. And the question becomes, what is Christ's relation to that lower Jewish God? Some Gentile Christian theologians will say that the relation of Christ and the high God to that God who's described in Genesis is a relation of opposition. In other words, the God who frames matter, the God who is poking around in people's sexual lives and saying, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Remember, this is a culture that privileges celibacy. That's obviously a lower God. So that, in a sense, the God of Genesis represents Christ's opposition. And Christ comes to redeem people who are baptized into him, redeem them from matter. The redemption in Christ is redemption from the flesh. And the, the Septuagint, the Jewish Bible, gives a sense of who the opposition to Christ is. That's one form of Gentile Christianity in the second century. A second form of Gentile Christianity in the second century is associated with Justin Martyr. And Justin says, no, it's true that the high God is not the God described in Genesis. Prima facie, I mean, that God is doing and making and doing things. That God is actually, wait for it, because this is so smart. The God described in Genesis is actually Jesus before his incarnation, in whom and through whom were all things made. So that the true God of the Jews, if the Jews understood how to read their book with spiritual insight, the true God of the Jews is actually Christ before his incarnation. And once you do that, it has the advantage. This is how the Jewish Bible became the Christian Old Testament. Once you do that, you end up having the Jewish scriptures really be a Christian book if you know how to read them allegorically and spiritually rather than in a fleshly way. I'm deliberately m mobilizing the terms in our double columns there. So this is the sort of, these are two schools of Christian theology. People are fighting with each other um, uh, about this. And there's a clarifying moment in um, 312 and since James Carroll has been here, um, you probably know what the clarifying moment is. It's his book before Jerusalem, Jerusalem was, anybody? Constantine's sword. What was Constantine's big idea in 312? It was a big government initiative behind religion, right? Constantine patronizes the type of Christianity that decides, was the second option I described, which makes the other types of Christianity heretical in a way that has social consequences. And Augustine, I've now jumped ahead to the fourth century. Augustine, when he goes to college, his freshman year, had a year that his mother must have hated because Augustine enters college in Carthage intending to be um, a pre-law major and he switches to a philosophy major. He gets a girlfriend and gets her pregnant. And that isn't even the worst thing, according to Monica. The worst thing is that he joins the sect of the Manichees, they're down on our list too, who are a fourth century version of the, that first type of second century Christianity I described to you. Augustine is a member of this heretical group for 10 years. And then he goes, to, he goes to Italy, and he ends up um, learning more about Catholic Christianity, and he ends up converting, and we all know, um, we all know what happens um, with him. So when he goes back to Africa, he encounters the writing of somebody he had studied under back in the day when he had been a Manichae heretic, and that man is Faustus, who now toward the bottom 
of the sheet. And now I'm going to jump out of the fourth century and tell you a story. In 1993, I had to give a paper in Jerusalem about Christian anti-Judaism. And I didn't finish my paper before I had to get on the plane. And I worked on my paper on the plane, and I got to Jerusalem, and I was still working on the I was so jet-lagged, I don't know what I was actually doing, but I still had to finish the book, finish the paper. And I knew that as a rule of thumb, the worst remarks that are made about Jews and Judaism in Christian writing, ancient Christian writing, are made not in writings that are against Jews themselves. They're made in writings that are against other Gentile Christians. It's just true. And the reason is because of the way rhetorically that whole idea of Jewishness works as, as a symbol for everything that's wrong religiously and intellectually with you know, perceiving the world carnally, um, uh, in a fleshly way, um, through works and not through grace and so on. So I thought, oh, great. Augustine wrote this, this book that's almost as long as The City of God. He wrote a book called Against Faustus, and Faustus is a manichae, and I said, I'll, I'll look at that really fast, and then I'll have exactly the material I need for my paper. And I opened the book, and to my amazement, it turned out I was exactly wrong. And instead, what was in Against Faustus was this very vigorous response to Faustus's criticisms of Catholic Christianity, which Faustus, the Manichae, had said was virtually Judaism. And this is what Faustus said. Faustus wrote a book to, for other Manichaean missionaries to tell them how to argue with Catholics about how Catholicism was, this always sounds like Jackie Mason, too Jewish. Catholicism was too Jewish, and Manichaeism was really the only type of proper Christianity. This is what Faustus, in this handbook for Manichaean missionaries, has to say. This is how he describes the Jewish scriptures. These books of the law, says Faustus, portray a God so ignorant of the future that he gave Adam a command without knowing that Adam would break it. Envy made him fear that a human being might eat of the tree of life and live forever. Later, he was greedy for blood and fat from all kinds of sacrifices and jealous if these were offered to anybody other than himself. Sometimes he destroyed thousands of men over little, at other times over nothing, and he threatened to come with the sword and to spare no one, whether the righteous or the wicked. As if that isn't bad enough, said Faustus, look at some of the heroes in this book. We Manichees, says Faustus, are not the ones who wrote that Abraham, inflamed by his frantic craving for children, did not fully trust God's promise that Sarah would conceive, and then, even more shamefully, because he did so with his wife's knowledge, he rolled around with a mistress, that's Hagar. And later, on two different occasions, he marketed his own marriage, selling Pharaoh once to Abimelech and once to Pharaoh, lying and claiming she was his sister instead of his wife because she was very beautiful. And what about Lot, who slept with his own two daughters once he escaped Sodom? And what about Isaac, who, imitating his father, passed off his wife Rebekah as his sister? And what about Jacob, Isaac's son, who had four wives and who rutted around like a goat among them? And what about Judah, his son, who slept with his own daughter-in-law? You know, at this point, you know, you're beginning to see hey, this guy has a point. With the, he slept with his own daughter-in-law, Tamar. And what about David, who seduced the wife of his own soldier, Uriah, while arranging for him to be killed in battle? And Solomon, with his 300 wives and 700 concubines? And what about the prophet Hosea, who married a prostitute? And Moses, who committed murder? This is great rhetoric. Either these stories are false, says Faustus, or else the crimes that they relate are real. Choose whichever option you wish, because both are despicable. 
When Catholics heard this from Manichaean missionaries, they became unnerved. And as a result, some of Augustine's colleagues in Carthage asked Augustine to respond. Augustine was busy fighting with another Gentile Christian at the time, the second grouchiest church father in antiquity. The first grouchiest one is Tertullian. The second grouchiest one is Jerome. And that's who Augustine was fighting with. He was having a fight with Jerome over whether the apostles kept Torah after the resurrection. And Augustine said yes, and Jerome, of course, said no. And Augustine argued that the Bible, even though it must be understood allegorically, also has to be understood historically. And he takes that idea and he uses it with Faustus himself. And he looks at Faustus's handbook and he argues that Faustus is right. Catholic Christianity is fleshly, and it should be. And Jews are fleshly, and that's a good thing. Because, he argues, redemption is not redemption from the flesh. Redemption is redemption of the flesh. And whatever spiritual meaning the Bible, and whether the Old Testament or the New Testament has, it also has to remain true to that idea that God works in time and that history matters as well as eternity. The Bible isn't ironic. When God gives Israel the law, no matter what else, what other allegories the law may contain, historically it must also mean that God was concerned that Israel not eat pig that Israel circumcised its children on the sons on the eighth day. In other words, that the Jewish observance of Jewish law, says Augustine, is praised as a good thing in the Bible, and it really was a good thing. He argues that Jesus himself kept the law scrupulously. The reason Jesus argued with the Pharisees is not because the Pharisees were, were very picky in particular and Jesus was kind of loose and casual about the law, but exactly the opposite reason. Jesus kept the law scrupulously and he didn't like the way the Pharisees were doing it. In fact, Jesus kept the law so scrupulously, I love this, this is the only place I've ever seen this argument. It's um, the third or fourth line from the bottom, chapter 16 of the Contra Faustum. Jesus was so scrupulous about keeping the law that he kept it perfectly even when dead. <laughs> Let me explain. It's very clever and it lets you know how much Augustine knew about Judaism. Jesus is sure, the different, one of the differences between Jesus and other mortals, says Augustine, is that Jesus' will is completely effective over his flesh so that while we die involuntarily, our souls are torn from our flesh, unwilling at death. Jesus relinquishes his flesh voluntarily. And unlike us who have to wait for the resurrection of the flesh, Jesus voluntarily chose when to pick up his own flesh. So when did Jesus die? Before sundown on Friday, before the beginning of the Sabbath. And when did he pick up his flesh again? On Saturday? No, that would have been carrying in the public domain. He waits until Sunday to pick up his flesh. He waits until the Sabbath is completely over before he, he picks up um, his flesh again. Also, says Augustine, the apostles and Paul, both before the resurrection and after the resurrection, kept the law, were pious Jews, sacrificed animals in the temple. At this point, both Faustus and Jerome must have been going crazy. All of this stuff was done correctly. And it wasn't until the temple is destroyed in 70 that Jewish Jews who are followers of Christ stop living Jewishly. But Augustine goes beyond that. Looking at the destruction of the temple in 70, he says, 
sure, one way to look at it is that God was punishing Jerusalem for uh, the rejection of Christ. But the other way to look at it, says Augustine, is that it is also a, bene a beneficial action for the church because as a result of that destruction, Jews, not Christian Jews, regular straight-up law-observant Jews, moved throughout the Mediterranean carrying the Bible with them. And as a result, with the spread of the Bible throughout the culture, it made a pathway through which Christianity could spread. And finally, and this is something that will have social consequences well beyond Augustine's lifetime, Augustine says for his Jewish contemporaries that the Jewish practice of Jewish religious tradition is still correct for Jews. And he says that any monarch, this is shocking, any monarch, whether pagan or Christian, who attempts to separate Jews from Judaism will visit upon himself God's sevenfold curse by which God protected Cain. If you think back to the story of Cain in Genesis 4, God puts his mark on Cain. Now, the mark of Cain in English vernacular, we think of it as a mark of shame or something like that, but Augustine's a better reading, a reader of the biblical text. The mark of Cain is a mark that God puts on Cain to protect him. And so the Jewish practice of Jewish law is the sign that the Jews give to society surrounding them, whether that society is Christian or pagan that they stand under the protection of God. Because, says Augustine, there's no other explanation for why Judaism could have lasted so long unless it were God's will. Those of you who know a little bit more about Augustine than simply what I'm reviewing together now know that Augustine was one of the architects of the state coercion of Christian minorities. He masterminded the political program against the other North African Christian church, the Donatists. He very vigorously supported Christian government's initiatives to shut down pagan temples. Augustine was not heavy into interfaith dialogue. Um, he was a fourth century bishop. And yet around the Jewish population and the Jewish practice of, of Jewish law, he drew a magic circle. And he said that Jews are supposed to be in a Christian society, live as Jews uninterrupted, and that that's the will of God. Believe me, no other church father said this. The reason Augustine comes to these ideas is because he's arguing both against Faustus and against Jerome. It's an intra-Christian theological argument. But it's, again, about the status of Jews in Judaism, but also about the status of the flesh. If you look at our Greco-Roman binary opposites again, what Augustine does is say that without this historical, concrete practice of Judaism, you have a devaluation of history and of the flesh. And if you think that way, you can't really have Christianity, he says, because that betrays the doctrine of creation, of incarnation, and of resurrection. So there's a way that the demonstration of Judaism within Christian culture ends up, in a sense, protected so that with the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, and when Western Europe ends up devolving into a much more violent culture with the Western Middle Ages, this one piece of Augustine's theology, which is again an intra a piece of creative intra-Christian fighting, detaches in a sense and floats, floats free and it ends up actually protecting Jewish lives and the many more violent days of the Western Middle Ages. So if Augustine hadn't been fighting with Faustus and Jerome, that might not have happened. And that's what I discovered when I only had a few more hours left to finish my paper in Jerusalem um, in 1993. And I had to squeeze it into that paper 
for which I had 20 minutes. And eventually it took the book to give, tell the whole story. And that's a story I wanted to share with you tonight. Thank you. It's much easier to talk than it is to listen. I know that. And you've been listening very patiently. Are there any questions about either Augustine in particular, something on the handout, or something I said? Because we still, we still have some time, right? And then we'll get to the cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the Donatists in your talk. In your mm -hmm. book, you really go into uh, that subject quite a bit. Could you just maybe give us a 30-second like summary of the Donatists and their beliefs and juxtapose to Augustine's? The Donatist soundbite, absolutely. If I can't do it, who could, right? Um, in 303, a Wednesday, no, there was a person, one of the last pagan persecutions uh, of Christianity happened in the first few years of the fourth century. And uh, in North Africa, uh, some of, it was aimed particularly, the coercion was aimed particularly at bishops. Some bishops cooperate and they hand over the books of scripture to be burned. Other Christian bishops resist and they are imprisoned or some of them are martyred. And then 312, it's a different, it's a new day. Constantine uh, makes his decision. But meanwhile, the church in North Africa is split between the church that had witnessed, in a sense, in the face of persecution, and that group that the, the witnessing church called traitors, traditori, right? They, were, they had handed over the, um, the books. Constantine is, is asked by both branches of the church um, to adjudicate which bishops are the right ones and the ones who were the traitors. This, the witnessing church wants to be fired and put in bishops who hadn't compromised themselves. Constantine is a very successful administrator. What does he do? He convenes a committee to look into it. And the committee decides that the group that handed the scriptures over are the Catholics, the represent the universal church and that the church that was the witnessing church should join in union with those church. And the, ch the church in North Africa says absolutely not. And as a way to discredit them, they are, they are called by the name of one of their own bishops, the Donatists. And by calling them Donatists instead of Christian, you're already rhetorically waiting the, um, waiting the argument. And it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Um, in North Africa for ages after that. And that is the really big fight that's going on in Augustine's period. It's in the context of fighting with the Donatists that Augustine will often say the most negative things about Jews because he'll be saying that the Donatists are even worse than the Jews, right? But against Faustus, he says, no, there are, uh, Catholics and Jews are one community. So it all depends. But every teenager knows this. It all depends on who you're fighting, what you, um, what you have to say. Is that... Okay for the Donatus. Anything surprising about this? This is some of my. This is when I've gotten um, emails from uh, some of my uh, Jewish readers. They have complained that Augustine doesn't really like real Jews. He likes this theological construction of Judaism that he dreams up uh, to win a fight with another Gentile uh, Christian opponent. And um, a couple of things about that. Can I, may I talk about real Jews for a minute instead of you know back on planet Earth, not just theological ideas about Jews? Um, a couple of things. One of the big surprises in doing um, the research for this book and the first third of the book um, is, about, is about this is that it's, it's is again, good news. People got along with each other in antiquity. Jews were not an oppressed religious minority even well after the conversion of Constantine. Things, Jews are Roman citizens. And we get complaints, how do we know this? One of the ways we have, um, we also have sermons from church, uh, from bishops who were complaining about, once it's the high holiday, oh, oh, it's September, and half of you are gonna go missing and go build your friend Sukkot. We have bishops complaining about people in their congregation going to friends Passover seders. We have Jews who are members of town councils. So Jews, Christians, pagans, 
different types of heretics are all actually getting along very well in antiquity. And because we have, how do we know? Because we have the complaints about it by the ideologues of separation. And the ideologues of separation are the ones who are leaving us these elite written texts, which is like a thin crust of, of, um, of harsh rhetoric on top of this sea of easy social interrelations. And it's the ease of the social relations that's infuriating the people who are leaving us their documents. That's, um, that's one thing. The second thing is that 20 years ago, 20, maybe 30 years ago now, some letters of Augustine's were discovered. You always, it's always the last place you look, right? They, I don't, why did they go missing? I don't know. But somebody found them in, uh, bound with other things in a library. And among these letters was a, a letter that Augustine wrote to another North African bishop named Victor. And a man named Licinius had come to Augustine with, it's all about real estate. He had come to Augustine with documentation proving that he owned land, and he complained that Victor, this other bishop, had defrauded him of the land. And Licinius, the man's name, um, said to Augustine that if Augustine couldn't get Victor to give back this man's land, that Licinius was going to go and pursue it in a higher court. And what we have is Augustine's letter to his colleague, Bishop, telling Victor that Licinius has all the documentation, that Victor is in the wrong, and that Victor should give back the land immediately and apologize to Licinius. Licinius is a Jew. So Licinius has a case against a bishop and goes to another bishop to get it sorted out. And Augustine, the bishop, tells this other, his other Catholic colleague that the Catholic colleague's in the wrong. In other words, in the 4th, 5th century, here's a Jew who, as a Roman, expects property law to still work the way it should. And here's Augustine saying to this other bishop, you're going to lose if, if this goes into high. Not only are you going to lose, it's going to be embarrassing. So why don't we just fix this right now? So that, again, that's one of the few places where we know what actual people were really doing as opposed to, I mean, if you could hear some of Augustine's sermons on uh, the Passion of Matthew or something like that, you wouldn't expect this sort of thing. So there's a disconnect between the rhetoric and the reality that goes on in antiquity. But this particular rhetoric that Augustine uh, comes out with about Judaism will end up, after his lifetime, having real social consequences. How do you feel about ancient monotheists being polytheists? That usually alarms, upsets, and offends people. I'm very disappointed that you all seem so <laughs> calm about that. Yuri, okay, good, fine, be that way. No, um, no, it's, um, yes, please. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about, um, um, no, it's, I'm not talking about, I mean, obviously the Bible can be, there are greater you, O God, among the gods. I mean, there are all sorts of places in Psalms in particular where you can, you can see a plurality of gods, but, but somebody like, I've been reading Paul's letters, it seems like for a century, but, you know, I read them all all the time, every year, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's only a few years ago that I noticed that in 1 Corinthians, he says to his, his formerly pagan congregation, look, we all know that there are many gods and many lords. We worship, you know, the high God through uh, his son, Jesus Christ. But Paul himself acknowledges that there are many gods. Um, many gods is the normal population of heaven in antiquity. And these people, are eventually in the Middle Ages, these gods are demoted to demons takes on a meaning of meaning what demons, a demon then is basically a demon now. But back in the first century and back in the fourth century, um, these, these entities are, are divine. So even if you're a Jew or a Christian, you still know that there are many other gods. It's just that your god is the highest god. Please. I've had Hindu friends who've told me that, you know, we're no different than you, really. We have all these gods, but it's all really the same thing. They say, we're really no different than you. Um, 
is is Hinduism organized hierarchically also? I think so, but I'm not really that knowledgeable. I'm a West, you know, I hang around the Mediterranean. I really don't know. Yeah. With ethnicity, and yeah. Really no different than you. We may have people say we're polytheists and we have all these gods, but it's all really the, the same. Different, different aspects of the same god. Of the same thing. Maybe my next book will be on Augustine and Hinduism. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. One question here, and then I'll see you. Yes, please. Yes. First of all, I don't think anybody was staying up late at night worrying that suddenly everybody was going to be celibate. That's the first part. Secondly, the ethic of celibacy is something that is um, a standard for um, a self-designated elite initially. It's something that really comes over from pagan um, philosophy. And um, there's a fight in the fourth century um, between, uh, again, different, uh, different celibate um, Christian theologians about whether virgins are of a higher spiritual order than married people and so on. And it's, it's an argument that happens um, in the fourth century. But I think in terms of a common ethic, um, But, well, marriage is one of the sacraments of the church. I mean, and it's, in fact, that's one of the things, one of the complaints that uh, Faustus makes against um, uh, Catholics is where he says Catholics are too Jewish, is um, Catholics believe in, uh, uh, they celebrate marriages as good things, and then they're happy when people have babies, and that's philosophically tacky. Um, <laughs> Catholicism now is structured much more, uh, well, it's much more structured. In the fourth century, these things are just evolving. But it depends on what level of function you choose to uh, take responsibility for within that community, I guess is the best way to do it. I, one minute, please. There was a hand. Yes, please. You referred a couple of times to the social consequences of August, Augustine's point of view. Mm -hmm. Could you just elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I start, um, this doesn't sound like it'll be a happy book, but I, I start the book out uh, with a pogrom um, in the, uh, during the Second Crusade. There is um, a rabbi talks about Bernard of Clairvaux appearing before there is a pogrom. And um, Bernard said, but the rabbi doesn't know that Bernard is quoting um, Augustine, but he quotes from a psalm, slay them not. You know, if you kill a Jew, it's like killing Jesus. It's okay to kill Muslims, says Bernard. Remember, this is the Second, you know, the second Crusade. But don't, you shouldn't kill Jews because it's like killing Jesus himself. And then Rabbi Ephraim of Bonn goes on to say that you know, they, they, stopped, they stopped killing us. And that is what you hear as an echo in, in the remark attributed to Bernard is this echo of Augustine's teaching on the Jews. Now, Augustine lived in a society where Jews were not regularly the targets of violence. But it's, the, it's the, that teaching, which is originally completely within the context of intra-Christian theologizing, ends up detaching from that and becoming a kind of social directive. This is why in the Middle Ages, popes were often the protectors of, um, of Jewish populations. The popes had read their Augustine, um, and that's... That's how that works. So that's how the, this, this fourth, fifth century theological teaching ends up having social legs in the, in the 11th century and in the 12th century. I, do we give Augustine credit for it? I mean, he couldn't have imagined uh, that the, I think that, uh, the, that there would be a post-Roman world. I mean, we don't know what's going to be 100 years from now. Um, so he can't be given credit directly for it. Um, but I kind of give him credit anyway, because I think it's a good thing. Yes, please. Can you, uh, 
<laughs> no, but I'll try. Um, did everybody understand the question? You're talking about modern Christianity and a modern understanding of the Shema, but ancient Jews were saying the Shema and they believed that many gods existed. So again, it's how you interpret a text. How did, how did, how did, you want me to explain the Trinity on one leg? Again, if I, if I can't do this, um, sure. Um, Greek philosophy, it all starts, I mean, Greek philosophy for all theological systems is like what math is to physics. You just can't do physics without math. You just can't do the Christian theology without Greek philosophy, right? The high God in Greek philosophy, that idea of, of a high God is Greek and philosophical. And the high God is, there is that part of God which is completely radically unknowable, so transcendent, can't even, you know, we'll never know what God is in his absolutely radical transcendence is one aspect of the high God. God in that, remember, God is imagined in Greek philosophy like a mind that thinks. It doesn't move, but it thinks. Then there's that aspect of God that's self-conscious. God knows he's God. That's why I can't stand philosophy. How does, you know, how does the philosopher know that? And the third thing about God is that because God is not a creator, but he's the source, he's the reason why there's everything else. You're not gonna have much a definition of God if you can't explain why everything else is. There's a part of God that faces the world, in a sense. And all of this language is metaphorical because God is something that is very much not like us. And then you relate that to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you got the Trinity. How'd I do? <laughs> not that bad, thank you. <laughs> Uh, another, another questions. I see some students really have to get back. Please take a cookie before. All right, maybe she will. Um, yes, please. Oh, that's easy. Did everybody hear the question? How does what I just How does what I just said about the Trinity relate to the first commandment? Right. That's easy. There are many gods but you only worship the God of Israel, right? If, if you are a member of the covenant community that takes responsibility for the Ten Commandments, the God you worship is the God who's giving you those commandments. That's, that's how that would figure in antiquity. Um, right, but the way that, I don't know about the historical Abraham, I know about the stories of Abraham in the Bible, and the way those stories would have been read by ancient people would be to understand that even though Abraham might, th see Jews, let me start all over again, Jews are considered odd in antiquity, not like now, now yeah, <laughs> Jews were considered odd by people who had a philosophical education because Jews insisted that their God was ethnic. What's his handle? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's an ethnic God, and he's also the highest God. Remember when I was talking? I think you hadn't quite come in yet um, when I was talking about that. It's fine. No, no, it's fine. Um, so Jews insist that their high God is the ethnic God, but it's the, it's the, um, the highest God. And, um, but Jews also know that other gods exist. They just don't worship them, which isn't the same thing. In antiquity, this is, I don't mean to sound like my own mother, but by the book, it's all, it's all in the book. There, Jews show respect for the gods of others in antiquity. We have inscriptions from Jews who will, for example, give a big donation to the Olympic Games. Well, so what? Jews still do that, right? What's the difference between Olympic Games now and Olympic Games in antiquity? 
the Olympic Games are a form of, it's like a prayer, a social prayer to Zeus, the, the god on Olympus. So that's a way, sponsoring dedicated games, dedicated to another god, is something that Jews did in antiquity. We have Jews who um, will be donors to, and how do we know this? Because they get a lovely donor plaque. They're, do they're donors to a subscription for a temple, to Augustus, or something like that. They may not pray in the temple or sacrifice in the temple, but they'll donate to the temple. It's, it's showing respect that's important. Because in antiquity, um, let's, let's think about religious pluralism for a minute. It's sort of like America, only different. Nobody, if all gods exist in antiquity, you've got to be careful, right? And if God's attacked to, attached to particular people, you don't want, nobody wants an angry God on their back. So you're going to be, all right, you want to worship Zeus? Psychosun, go ahead and worship Zeus. All right, and you want to worship, um, you want to worship the God of Israel? All right, go ahead. You know, I think he's a loser. His temple was destroyed, but if you feel that way, go ahead. So there's this, there's this kind of, um, pluralism in antiquity that changes once we have our kind of post-scientific revolution monotheism where if you're not doing what I'm doing, not only are you doing something different, but you're doing it wrong. That type of you're doing it wrong is something that happens internally to individual communities. But across religious communities in antiquity, there's, there's a kind of measured... Uh, tolerance is the wrong word, because that's, again, a, um, a civic society word. It's pluralism. There are lots of different peoples and lots of different gods. And people, by and large, got along uh, pretty well. It was what Christians said to each other, just like what Jews said to each other. That's where the real fireworks uh, can start. And as I will end this with something my mother said to me all the time, if you can't say something nice, don't say and um, because that's how really a lot of the anti-Judaism of formative Christianity developed was by looking at the intra-Jewish argument uh, that was available in the Gospels and in uh, the Jewish Bible. And my husband's beginning to move and put his things in his briefcase, which means the lecture's over. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.